thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here. And in particular, I'm very grateful that you organized this discussion of each of the chapters. I very much look forward to your comments and suggestions later on. Um, so this is the transition report that was launched in November. Um, this is actually the first virtual presentation I'm doing, um, and it might be one of the first overall, um, and it's on digitalization. I have done my best to summarize the key findings in about 10 minutes. Um, what I've done is I tried to pick a couple of the key messages, but also somewhere I think either the identification or some of the data sources might be more novel or more interesting. Um, I kept them in the order um, as they appear in the report so that we can have an easier discussion afterwards. Um, but you'll see that the thread running through is very much of the potential that digitalization has uh, to bring benefits to households and firms, but at the same time that this requires preconditions, not only in terms of infrastructure, but for instance, also in terms of the presence of digital skills, but also being wary that it could result in the widening of divides and digital divides often coinciding with various socioeconomic ones. The first chapter of the report starts off by building an index of digitalization. Um, this combines 22 measures of various enablers, as well as use of digital technologies by firms and households. It builds on several previous such indices, um, but we wanted to update it and make sure that all of the countries in the EBRD regions are included. And this highlights large digital divides across countries. Um, this bar chart shows you the digitalization index in 2015 and 2020, you can see towards the left of the chart, um, for example, Estonia, Slovenia, Lithuania, with relatively high levels of digitalization comparable to many advanced economies. Towards the far right, um, several economies in Central Asia and the Southern and Eastern Mediterranean, which lag behind even some of the emerging market comparators that we have here, like Re Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, or India. We also see significant digital divides within economies. So you might expect it's typically um, the young, those with higher levels of education and income, those living in urban areas that tend to be more digital and this holds across a range of indicators. They're more likely to shop or bank online. They're more likely to use e-government services and they typically have better digital skills. Um, but we didn't just want to compare the latest snapshot, um, but also wanted to examine how these rankings have changed over time. Um, so the scatter plot shows you the digitalization index in 2015 on the horizontal axis against the 2015-2020 change on the vertical one, and shows that it's really economies at medium levels of digitalization. Um, for instance, Serbia, Ukraine, North Macedonia, Belarus, that have seen some of the largest gains. Um, in this period. And this is compared to many advanced economies and some more digital economies in the EBRD regions, which have seen more limited gains given their already high levels of digitalization. But quite strikingly, changes were also more limited in some of the least digital economies, for instance, in Central Asia, suggesting that the gap between these economies and others may be widening. Actually, we see a very similar pattern looking within economies. Um, I mentioned earlier that the young, highly educated are most digital. The largest gains we've seen uh, among those ages 25 to 54, um, those with upper secondary education catching up to those with tertiary education, those with just above median income catching up to the richest groups, whereas those over the age of 55 with less than secondary, um, lower secondary education, um, and those in the poorest income deciles were falling further behind. We also um, try to identify the key constraint to progress in terms of digitalization based on this um, digitalization index that we constructed. And here we look at infrastructure, regulation, e-government, and skills, and find that for many economies in the EBRD regions, skills are the key constraint holding back further progress on digitalization. Now, this is a region that is um, known to have significant brain drain, as many other emerging markets. Um, but what we found is that is, this is even more pronounced for some digital skills. So here we draw on a new database that is by the LinkedIn and World Bank. 
um, and it draws on LinkedIn members' profiles. So it looks at the skills listed on these profiles as well as international moves and allows us to say, for example, that one and a half percent of those that list tech or disruptive tech skills on their profile moved abroad from countries in the EBRD regions in 2019. Now, while we see brain drain across the board, this is more pronounced for digital skills than for others. So this one and a half percent compares, for instance, with about 1.1 percent for soft skills or only 0.8 percent for business skills on the far right here. There's also less digital training in the BRD regions than in advanced economies. This draws on a survey from Eurostat and shows on the left that the share of those who do some free digital training is actually pretty comparable between um, emerging Europe and advanced economies. Differences are much more significant when you look at training that they either paid for themselves and was paid for by the government, or in particular, if it was paid for by the employer or in the form of on the job training. And we find that such low levels of digital skills are constraining the use of digital technologies by firms and households, even where the digital infrastructure is present and even where the services are provided. So, for instance, we see significant differences in the use of e-government services depending on the average level of skills in the population. This is likely to become even more of a constraint in the future as economies shift towards more digital sectors and more digital occupations. Here, um, the blue dots show you employment growth in more digital sectors. The hollow diamonds um, show employment growth in less digital sectors. You can see that digital sectors are faster growing in most economies where we have data. And analysis from the LinkedIn World Bank database suggests that even within occupations, digital skills are becoming more important. And this is often the case, even in occupations and sectors not traditionally thought of as digital, for instance, paper or food processing. The second chapter um, documents large improvements in digital infrastructure in the EBRD regions and links these um, to improvements in firms' performance. Here you can see expansion of 3G and 4G networks. You can see dark dots. Um, for some of the uh, large metropolitan areas, Warsaw, Budapest, Bucharest, for example, but you can see much lighter colors suggesting worse coverage and more limited coverage in smaller cities and less densely populated areas. This chapter um, also draws on two case studies using new data on the one hand expansion of fiber internet in Turkey, which Turkey has invested in heavily, and then in turn the rollout of 3G uh, mobile infrastructure in Russia. And these document significant benefits for firms. So for instance, in Turkey, I find that this allowed um, manufacturing firms to increase their exports to distant markets to introduce new products. For Russia, this led to higher revenues and increased employment for the smallest firms. And this relies on a kind of difference in difference approach, exploiting the boundaries of the reach from these 3G towers. The next chapter um, is very much motivated by the sharp rise in teleworking that we saw as a result of the pandemic. Um, and it documents that even though um, actual and theoretically possible remote working are highly correlated, um, actual levels of remote working remain far below what would be theoretically possible. So the scatter on the horizontal axis shows you the share of jobs that could be done from home in terms of the tasks that involve on the vertical axis. Um, you have how much actual teleworking is happening, the share of respondents who say they work from home at least sometimes. See some advanced economies such as the UK, Sweden and Netherlands in the top right corner, but that actual teleworking is fairly limited in most of the EBRD regions. Interestingly, this is the case even where occupational structures are fairly similar. For instance, if you look at Lithuania and Estonia here on top of each other with very similar occupational structures in terms of ability of teleworking, um, but much higher rates of actual working from home in Estonia. And the chapter suggests that one of the factors that could be behind this is low levels of trust. Um, and we find that this may also be what lies behind different preferences of employees here in the red bars split by gender and employers, the blue bars again split by gender in terms of how much remote working they would like after the pandemic with on average a difference of about a day per week.
And then finally, the last chapter looks at the impact of digitalization on the financial system, where um, fintech innovators, for instance, peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms are um, chipping away at the traditional model of banks, um, offering mix and match services to customers, thereby creating competition for banks, um, where most of these do see automation and robotization as the key trend and the key challenge for them over the next 25 years, interestingly, ahead of um, COVID-19 and other pandemics, even though this survey was done in the middle of the pandemic, declining change. In response to this, banks have started to make substantial investments in new technologies, um, whether that's biometric identification, digital wallets, um, screening procedures for loan applications, and they have also started offering much more online services. Um, but at the same time, they started cutting down their branch networks, in particular in less densely populated rural areas. And you can see that this especially affects Central Europe and the Baltics and Southeastern Europe, where most banks expect their branch networks to be cut further, um, creating worries of inclusion, where less digital households in rural areas may now also lose access to traditional brick and mortar bank branches, but also creating worries for productivity itself, because the chapter also shows that online banking and actual branches often act as complements rather than substitutes. Um, let me stop here, and I very much look forward to the discussion. Excellent. Thank you very much for uh, a very thorough and a very well presented review. And thank you very much for being right on time. I had full faith in that. Uh, I actually have a question. Um, what is the particular state of the Baltic countries, uh, in particular Estonia? Because they are often projected as countries that are very heavily digitized and they have made a lot of uh, progress towards that area with. Uh, to, towards the digital state, towards being pioneers in some sense in uh, in fintech. So, how do they stand up? And out? How oh, sorry? How do they stand out from uh, the sample? Um, they, I think in that sense, very much confirm our expectations, both in terms of the overall digitalization index and when looking at the role of fintech. Um, so the digitalization index, the way it's constructed is measured relative to a frontier of the best performing economy across the two years, 2015 and then 2019, 2020, depending on data availability. And Estonia is actually our frontier country for 2020 for e-government. Um, so Others are scored relative to that frontier. Um, no country reaches the frontier overall, um, but all three of the Baltics come very close to it and very close to advanced economy levels of digitalization. Um, they also stand out um, in terms of fintech and generally innovative um, finance relative um, to population, to the size of their markets in the last chapter. Um, I think the last chapter even has a special box on the Baltics um, um, as a possible unified market in this regard. Mm -hmm. Do they report any specific constraints though? Because uh, I understand how brain drain, for example, could relate or how lack of infrastructure might relate in some cases, but are there any speci very specific constraints they report in, uh, in evolution, any development? Um, so I think on the financial side, um, they are very much facing the constraints of being small markets, um, including in terms of population. Um, for chapter one's identification of key constraints, um, we do it in a way that by definition, every country will have a key constraint, even if it scores very highly on all four indicators. Um, for Estonia, it's actually infrastructure. Um, so relative to its performance on regulation, e-government services where I said it is the frontier and skills it actually does relatively worse on infrastructure even though its infrastructure is captured by um, both quality availability and affordability of mobile and fixed broadband it does very well compared to its peers. Thanks thank you very very much. Okay so I suppose we can continue with uh, chapter one uh, Professor Slavora Dosevich. Thank you. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, first, thank to Zoska for a very uh, concise, uh, excellent presentation. But for people that haven't read the report, you know, kind of, I really urge you to um, read the report um, because it's uh, quite uh, condensed and um, there's extremely 
much substance there. So my comments will be on the first chapter on uh, digital divides and um, uh, what are the, for me, the distinctive features of uh, this year transition report is that uh, it's empirically extremely well grounded. If you look at just the number of um, surveys, uh, data sources, which form the basis, it's, it's amazing. It's kind of, I even forgot to add the LinkedIn, which is a kind of, uh, so it's extremely well prepared. It's analytically very sophisticated. It improves from year to year. This year, we even have a spatial regression, discontinuity design type of regressions. Uh, so that's extremely all uh, very good. Um, very much mainstream type of report. I mean, as you can imagine, I, I will um, uh, 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 interpret it from, from, from my angle, which means that there are lots of positives when the report is mainstream, which means that it is analytically rigorous, it's internationally comparable, it's academically solid, it's also politically acceptable, kind of policy neutral, so to say, you know, kind of. Uh, why? Because um, in the end, uh, it, a report has its policy purpose and, and has to be acceptable. But also, I must say that being a mainstream, that it also has its some uh, uh, negatives. First of all, is this kind of, uh, from my perspective, kind of policy relevance where you try to uh, derive policy implications directly from the analysis. For me, that is always kind of um, seems academically correct, but from the perspective of, of policy makers, uh, that always doesn't work. And it also reports um, ignore policy capabilities and, and, and the whole issue of politics of policy because it's highly contentious area. But that's the, the, the nature of, of the report. It's somewhat superficial in my view on the treatment of, um, if you want developmental or structural challenges, uh, and I will uh, try to touch uh, a bit uh, more about that. Analytically, in terms of methodology, because it's, it's a kind of uh, completely based in, in, in um, based on surveys, based on the applied econometrics, which has its uh, uh, positive size, but also it means that you have predefined assumptions, what are the, the relevant issues. You come with a survey where you actually assume that you know what are the problems, and, and then the analytical work is to large extent, implicit or explicit kind of hypothesis testing, you are checking what you are expecting to, uh, to do. While uh, in a sense, you know, uh, this is an area of structural change. It is a, a new area where actually one would want to learn and discover a new things. And I couldn't find kind of much of the new things. It was more kind of confirming on checking what is already there available in, in, the, in the literature. Focus is very much on something which I would call horizontal digitalization, which means the issues which you would expect, which is uh, e-governance, infrastructure, and digital skills of uh, uh, population. So in that case, even the title digital divide is very much uh, uh, mainstream. And I think that it neglects something which I would label here uh, vertical digitalization. What do I mean by that? That may become clear in my focusing comments on, on, on three issues. Uh, first is the digital skills. Uh, second is the IC to services and export hubs. This is the issue which the um, uh, report touches on, but it does not actually go deeper into it. Although for me, that is one of the crucial issues in terms of uh, uh, productivity, growth and upgrading on economies. And the, at the end, um, the policy approach to digitalization. Let me go briefly to, to each of these uh, three. In terms of digital skills, uh, report assumed that human skills and uh, capital, human capital and skills are enough for digitalization based technology upgrading. Kind of. And, and there, these are kind of uh, statements in the, in the report uh, where we have lots of evidence of how you know, higher skills are uh, related to the um, different levels of uh, development and on the returns. And in that uh, um, context, you know, a report focuses on the policies which would. Uh, the investment in digital skills, adapting schools curriculum, digital literacy, and, and so on and so on. But let me uh, use the example of country of Estonia, which I uh, know a little bit uh, more and a few others uh, to illustrate this kind of um, uh, digital challenge to the way how can it be seen from alternative perspective. Uh, it's very nicely illustrated in the report. It's a top country in terms of e-government. Uh, so from that side, uh, you know, Estonia has this uh, image which um, truly corresponds to, uh, to data. Also, there's a high number of locally uh, linked uh, um, or local unicorns, but basically they're not linked to local economies. You would expect uh, once they emerge, they, they, they 
uh, go abroad. And in terms of uh, uh, diffusion of digital technologies, we also have a, uh, let's say, if I take example of wood processing sector, which is uh, primarily using foreign made uh, um, industry four type of uh, technologies with applications of the, of the uh, primarily um, foreign developed digital solutions. So this is a situation which is kind of on the top range in the uh, EBRD uh, region, where on one side we see public sector very much uh, uh, digitalized, we see uh, startups emerging from that area, and then we see this gap in terms of uh, um, uh, industries, in terms of ser services which are relying on the uh, foreign made digital solutions, which is actually expected in a small economy where the, the size of the market itself is, is an issue. Uh, the issue which is uh, for me intriguing in the case of uh, uh, countries like Estonia, there is this variety which comes in the last 20, 30 years of a variety of um, uh, digital solutions in Estonia. Uh, uh, there is a high level of uh, uh, human capital. And yet at the same time, we do not see kind of Estonia being uh, uh, kind of uh, significant in terms of uh, uh, exporting, in terms of changing industrial uh, structure towards the uh, more digital uh, related activities. And this raises this issue, are the competencies uh, or human skills sufficient for uh, a kind of uh, uh, um, a digital economy driven, uh, driven growth. Okay. And when you look at the um, Estonian innovations, that they are mainly customized innovations. They're not directly transferable to other countries. They're easy to imitate, they're in service provision, even if they were um, possibly to export, there is a marketing barriers to, uh, to export, which leads to this uh, uh, crucial issue where these competencies reside, whether the individuals, whether the human skills are sufficient if you want to explain the um, technology upgrading of the, of the uh, economy. And I want to put it in, in a broader context where we have, let's say, uh, countries which may be comparable uh, cases. If you look at the India, Indian software story, you cannot explain by human skills. Uh, success on Indian software story, you can explain basically by the organizational capabilities of uh, large Indian companies which manage to acquire project management skills and then make use of the um, human skills. Human skills by themselves without being put in the organizational context uh, uh, are not sufficient. In the past, I've done in electronics case of Videoton where you have out of uh, 10 former socialist electronic conglomerates, there was only one due to organizational skill which managed to survive. And I want to illustrate that uh, point in today's situation in the, in the case of Ukraine, because I was involved uh, uh, in a project there for the World Bank, where we uh, managed to uh, track the growth upgrading path of uh, the um, Ukrainian ICT companies. And uh, this is a kind of trajectory which you can detect in the case of uh, um, um, Ukrainian companies where most of the companies are in the outsourcing stages. In our context, this is the this basic IT support uh, and uh, uh, teams of individuals which are replacing basically uh, workers somewhere in, in, the, in, in other countries. And then we have this kind of crucial threshold level whether uh, these companies will move from the outsourcing stage towards the more kind of software engineering, more towards their own design, more towards their own product services. And of course, as you can imagine, only small number of these companies have managed to make this uh, transition, which from the kind of economic point of view, from the point of view of uh, uh, diversification value added is crucial because there is always danger if you are in this outsourcing uh, stage that you are in an outsourcing trap. As long as your engineer is then, you know, uh, half of the price of a foreigner, then you're fine. But it, uh, when that goes, then the whole uh, outsourcing story uh, reaches its uh, uh, limits. So in a sense, uh, most of firms are in low value uh, uh, segments. And the issue, which was for me very intriguing, what are those firms which managed to get out this outsourcing trap? And the explanation uh, that these firms which managed to get out of the outsourcing trap are those which have acquired kind of organizational capabilities where management was uh, uh, able to go against the kind of what its current profitability would suggest and manage to make investment in and go more into the project uh, um, um, capabilities and manage then not just to kind of, so to say, rent uh, a labor force, but also uh, to uh, develop project management uh, uh, skill. So we have- And I am sorry, you have two minutes left. Yeah, uh, if I have two minutes left, I will just summarize in the point that we have a, 
a challenge of the saturation of this outsourcing uh, model and the, the challenge of building these uh, uh, managerial upgrading uh, skills. So this is the issue from, uh, uh, from, from this point of view, whether it is sufficient, just look at the skills. Second is this uh, issue in the, in the report, which is the uh, ICT, where we have uh, enclaves in all the countries and uh, reports hint that very well. It points to the countries like uh, Belarus, Estonia, Serbia, Ukraine, which have ex established these uh, enclaves. And the issue which is um, for me neglected is that these are basically something which I call ICT exclaves. These are uh, sectors which uh, are not integrated into economy with very poor record uh, linkages. And then this is the crucial kind of structural change challenge. In that respect, I find a uh, report quite superficial, so to say, because there is assumption that there is some kind of automatic process where that may lead to a, a deeper uh, structural uh, change. The same situation I, I found even in, an, in a more uh, um, um, strongest terms in case of uh, uh, Moldova, which is also a country which is in this outsourcing trap where the uh, IT sector is without any absolute, any backward linkages in the local economy. So this is a kind of uh, a localized uh, uh, phenomenon which, uh, uh, where, where its effects on economic growth are then uh, basically quite uh, uh, marginal. A final uh, point is this, uh, the uh, approach, uh, when you look at the um, kind of what are the policy implications then, uh, in that respect, the report is uh, for me relatively conventional in terms of um, urging for investment in digital infrastructure, in digital uh, skills, government regulation, government uh, policy. Well, the whole point, and, and I'm doing with a few colleagues here on a research which looks at the innovation ecosystem where we have a data on digital uh, assets and where the, one of the major uh, conclusion is that uh, none of these kind of assets by themselves uh, uh, is, is effective, but we have to look at the complementarities between different assets. So you have to look at the digital assets, but then you have to look at the, uh, how they complement the others. So the point is that the, uh, uh, it has a strong policy implication because in that case, uh, you do not think about policy as a set of isolated activities, but you look at the policy as a, as a kind of systemic phenomenon where you have a largely then in that case, collective action problems. This is the kind of uh, based on our work on, on, on Ukraine, where it is a range of collective action challenges, you know, kind of, which means that uh, none of them can be solved by a range of isolated uh, policies. Let me okay. go. Thank you very, very much. That is exactly yeah, just a final, uh, final uh, slide. In a nutshell, I think that this is extremely informative um, report because, and it shows a continuous analytical improvement. I think its mainstream approach is its biggest quality, but also I think it's, it's a, also uh, a weakness because very often, basically, you are finding what uh, you are expecting. And, and there is a kind of too little, so to say, uh, a new insight or surprises where uh, you wouldn't uh, expect. But from mainstream perspective, it's absolutely worth to congratulate. Thank you very much and sorry for uh, uh, being over time. Okay. Thank you very May much. May I for the respond very quickly before you open up the floor? I was about to invite you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for all the comments. Um, very, very useful as always. Um, also good in terms of timing because we're preparing the so-called operational implications where we try to distill um, policy messages vaguely related to the TR for EBRD's own work. Um, so I have diligently been taking notes. Um, otherwise, I agree with um, many of the points you made. Um, I think it would have been nice or will be nice to do more work in the future, looking more at sort of the role of administrative constraints and how to do digital well, because I think there is still an underlying assumption that doing something digitally will automatically improve it um, without really realizing that if it's not a good system to start with, just putting it online will not solve many of the problems. Um, I Thing. I really like the point on ICT exclaves and limited links to the rest of the economy. Um, I have recently seen um, Tallinn's 
sort of um, innovative hub close to the airport, which is really turning out rather self-sufficient and detached from the rest of the economy uh, and also increasingly set up to be. So they have um, local um, residences and shops and an on-site doctor and nursery for those working in the IT campus so that there is really even minimal links with the rest of the city. And it's very high tech. That was the first place I saw under skin chips, open doors. Um, but I, I think it's a very vivid illustration of how limited the links are to the rest of the economy. Um, on the sort of ICT enclaves, exclaves, I think our new Bosnia and Herzegovina country diagnostic has a very nice section on some of the firms there. Um, I haven't heard Videlton mentioned since some of my parents' happy memories of their Dubrovnik conferences. Um, so that was also nice. Um, and on organizational capabilities, um, I think it's a, a very interesting point. I think our last chapter mentions a little bit about the management style of the CEOs and if this is generally more innovative, also having an effect on how much banks shift towards newer digital technologies. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for a very thorough comment and answer. So without any further ado, let's go to uh, Professor Rand Bruno for a commentary on the second chapter. Um, would you like me to share the screen? No, I just okay. shared it. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Yeah, I'm sharing with the account and speaking with the other. I hope uh, it's working. Uh, if you think that you can hear me well, I have absolutely no problem. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, and, and if you can see my presentation, I think it's the op best options and I can have a um, control of the, of the PowerPoint. Uh, Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to comment on uh, chapter two. I have the initial uh, a, a reaction of, of Zabo. Uh, so it's, I really suggest anybody to read the, the, the report. It's very interesting. Uh, it's very timely. Uh, the topic is extremely important and uh, it's extremely uh, uh, clear. So it's, uh, I, I enjoyed it and I, I think it's a very good read. And, it gives you a sense of uh, uh, where the region is going, but also where the kind of global economy is pushing the region to go. So I think it's extremely, extremely important. So I will focus on chapter two, and I will have a sort of initial part in which I summarizes the main uh, exactly the summary, and then I will comment on it, and I will try to address some uh, uh, some issues and some uh, some points. So uh, as this exactly summary, uh, we already had a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, from Zoka, but uh, I just want to go a little bit more in the details of this, this chapter. This is really what it comes from the chapter. So we have basically four points and two, uh, two uh, um, case studies. So the four points that the accessibility to a fixed broadband is uh, increased, and this is uh, the 15 year uh, process, and this is particularly important. And this happened particularly in countries with higher GDP per capita and higher population density. This is quite important message. I like that because uh, it gives you a sense what might be driving it or what are the kind of uh, uh, pull and pull factors in these cases. And uh, when it goes to the adoption, uh, it remains limited, limited though. So we, we, we still see sort of a, a supply and demand problem and, and also the infrastructure uh, uh, might actually exceed the expectations of case. For example, speed is very high, but if you have a lot of speed but not much coverage, <laughs> so you are sort of in a, in a problem. And uh, uh, what it seems to suggest that the, the, the chapter that the, the 4G, so the network, is trying to compensate for that. So, and this is not, not, not bad because uh, the availability of 3G and 4G uh, seems to be uh, uh, fine and actually quite good behind the levels of uh, European peers. Even if I have to say European peers are uh, uh, world frontier, so I, I wouldn't be too, too worried about that because uh, we have among the, 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 the most uh, digitalized countries in the world. So in a sense, uh, is a, is a, is, as a peer, uh, is, is sort of a, 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 a comparator that is, uh, is very, very tough. And, and this is, a, a, is about an evolution process. And this, this is what the message of the chapter is. There is an evolution is not particularly um, good in terms of level, but it's particularly good in terms of speed. And that's, uh, that's what we, we, we think uh, uh, can be appreciated about uh, the, this chapter. Then there are two, the two uh, 
case studies, I call them case studies, they are empirically very well done uh, and uh, uh, they are really, really tackling causality in a, in a very clever way. Uh, very, very detailed. They, they try to anticipate the objection from the reader. And there is the case study of Turkey and a case study of Russia. In case of case study of Turkey, we have a sort of uh, effects of the uh, high speed broadband, especially fiber cables, okay, on export of small manufacturing firms. And there seems to be a causality there. In Russia, there is about the networks, the 4G network, uh, and there seems to be a causality on employment and in and, and the, and the, the latter case, it's very strong, it's around 20%. So and this is, this is a, a result that uh, speaks by, by, by itself and it's, it's very important. And so the, the, the overall message is uh, quite obvious, I have to say, but also the, the, the transition mentioned this at the beginning. So this is what we would expect. So we will need to have more digital infrastructure and uh, uh, this might help especially specifically small, small firms. And so uh, policy-wise, this uh, seems to be uh, a no-brainer. Okay, so what I'd what I like to do in my comments actually is to, to think about three channels that I think are the reason why we really care about the digital infrastructure above and beyond the simple causality of digital and, and, and performance, because that's, a, that's obviously the, the usual suspect. So if, if you increase the digitalization, you expect more performance, and you can show it causally, uh, as the transition report chapter two does. But there are three hidden channels that are mentioned here and there, but not explicitly in the chapter. And I think these are very important. One is increasing returns, one is spillovers, and one complementarities. We already spoke about complementarities. Lava was sure one of my two uh, co-authors, Julia Orzla, would mention that. And also, I think it's particularly important because uh, at the firm level, we can observe that. So let me go through them. First thing, this is about increasing returns. And this is, this is really hidden in, in, in the chapter. I, the, the, the nature of the digital technology is a type of good that we can classify in different ways, call it club goods. And there are no rival in consumption, obviously up to a, a, a certain congestion point. And this makes them an increased return type of good that changes the dynamics in which the companies can work. On. And this is very, very important because uh, it's not a simple good. It's not like giving capital to, to companies. It's not like giving subsidy to companies. It's much more than that. And, and this is the reason why we have to care particularly, and that's the reason why uh, the transition reports is timely and very, very important. Now, second point, what about the spillover potentials? Okay, the digital technology have wide, wide ranges of spillover at different, different levels. Within the firms, uh, between firms, within and between sectors, and overall in the society. And this potential of spillover makes this type of investment particularly important because it has this trickle down effect that other type of goods do not have. And within firms, it can be a public goods for the firm. Between firms can be a customer supplier, a better interaction and making them much closer in terms of information asymmetries. Sectors can change the way the input output flows of both services and goods goes between the sectors. And this can have also strong implication on structural change. And the wider society, we can think, uh, for example, the implementation of 5G in Korea or public investments at Ala Rosenstein Rodan, uh, and also the entrepreneurial states idea of Matsukato that might actually have a very, very good effect above and beyond the firms that receive this, this above and beyond the sector. That is. And this is particularly important because is where externalities justify public intervention. So third is complementarities. Uh, Slava has just already touched upon that. And complementarity has, are at many, many levels. Um, and this can be with the high power level force. That's one of the focus of the, of the chapter three, but also with physical capital, but also many intangibles. It can be knowledge, it can be software data cloud, organizational capabilities. The chapter does mention that. And, but it's mentioned that sort of in a, in a, in a kind of toward the hands, oh, can be also that we need that. Yes, but that's really particularly important because digitalization without organizational capabilities and other type of intangibles will sort of fade away. And also uh, capital in, uh, in investing in upskilling, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the risks? The risks are the lack 
of increasing return. If we have uh, uh, strategies within the firms that instead of creating public goods at the firm level, they can, uh, I call them it gay fencing, okay? So we, we have companies that at, at, the, at the internal parts are not able to understand this public goods nature of, of the technology and they sort of create silos. And this at the in, internal level of the firm might be detrimental. Lack of spillovers, and this is maybe for a weak absorptive cap, uh, cap, uh, capacities or uh, other reasons and reverse complementarities, as uh, uh, we started with, uh, uh, with uh, Yulia, uh, Slavo, and, and Pierre. I am very, Cyber very security. sorry. You have two minutes left. Yeah, perfect. No, no, I, I, I'm going to finish in two minutes. So I, cybersecurity, this is mentioned uh, very well, but it's not mentioned much on privacy. And privacy is a ma major problem in the region, especially when you have uh, weak intellectual property rights and weak legal institutions. So the more the digital technology is banned, the more the privacy is, at, at, is, is under threat. And this is, this is something that I think we should be taught for the future uh, of, uh, of, the, of the work of uh, EBRT. And the coupling between digitization and greening. So um, let me give you two very quick uh, um, graphs on complementarities and on the coupling. So complementarity is what we find in study with, uh, with Julia, uh, Slavo and Kirill, we find that exactly technology, digital technology are useful only if they are coupled with other technologies or other type of asset investment. In this case would be capital. Uh, uh. And these uh, two graphs show you the, 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 the two different directions. So how digital capabilities can be enacted, enhanced by the, uh, tangible capital and vice versa. And you see there are some ranges in which this works. So we have to be careful. So it's not always the case that at any level that we can have a benefit with the institution. No, some, we, we have a combination of that. The last, uh, the last graph I'll show, and then I finish, uh, Elias, is about the risk of the decoupling with, between green and digitalization. Is it mentioned in the, in, the, in, the, in the chapter? It is mentioned about the green technology. But again, uh, sort of, of an aside results. I think actually is one of the biggest challenge because if we have digitalization that is decoupled, as we try to, uh, to show in a, in, a, in a report with Slavo and Kirill, uh, this might be a failure because we might actually end up with very digital, uh, digitalized economies, but not very much in a green direction. That's actually something that we, we cherish and we have to, to invest. And this is the, the relationship between uh, these two that doesn't seem to, to fly. So uh, uh, just a provocation, and then I'm finished. Uh, we have to think about the real loss sort of the big push idea. So a la Rosenstein Rodin. So if the club goods can become public goods, for example, 5G provision for all the public, in, in, in South Korea and try to invest in many sectors at the same time, maybe this digitalization will have much more effects than simply increase the productivity of the company. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for being considerate. Um, and I will put the BRT on the spot again. Thank you very, very much. Again, um, very nice comments that I'm very grateful for. Um, I think I've particularly taken note of the um, increasing returns spillovers angle, also linking back to Slavo's last sentence on really which policies should we be looking at to make sure that we do get these spillovers that are far from automatic and the links to the rest of the economy. Um, and your last slide on Big Push, I, I really like that idea. On privacy, um, I agree. I think it would be nice to put it back on the agenda. Um, I think it maybe features less in the transition report because, as you said, given that it maybe becomes more of an issue with more advanced digital technologies in surveys, we typically see that it's more of a concern in more digital advanced economies than most of the EBRD regions. It's actually a question we're hoping to add to the new life in transition survey um, to get a sense of how worried people are about this at the moment. Um, and I like the link between digital and green, which I think um, is, is areas that were, I mean, the green in particular, where EBRD likes to do more work in our upcoming transition report will probably have at least two chapters with the green link. Um, so hopefully that is something we can return to there. Thank you. Thank you very much for your reply. And actually, I have a question. Uh, about the last slide that was presented, I do not expect a very deep commentary, but uh, I was uh, slightly concerned about the costs from turning a club good into a public good. If there is any idea or any, any insight on that.
yes, it's it's for me a question like this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a provocation. Uh, it's the last slide because it's a provocation. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's the idea that um, given the three the three characteristics of of, of the digital, so increasing returns, spillovers, and uh, and complementarities, it would not be bold enough to think this is just a simple good, or even a club good. The 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 challenges country faces is exactly be able to uh, see the type of nature of digitalization and try to, to show bold action in terms of policy to make them public goods. And this is an example of 5G's provision in South Korea. Okay, so instead of giving 5G for a price, you give 5G for free. So you have big, big, and this might actually increase massively increase returns, complementarity and spillovers, and this, is, a, is, a, is an investment that might be a very expensive on face value, but actually have a much higher return in, in the medium long run. So that's a provocation. And I would say in this, I, I'm really with Mariano Mazzucato, it's about uh, the entrepreneurial state. So to have bold action that can benefit the society as a whole and seems to be digitalization one of the candidates. So that's that was a provocation exactly. Thank you very, very much. And that is a very nice leading for the next chapter, chapter three on teleworking, AI, and the labor force. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's uh, been really a, a nice opportunity to read the report, and I can just echo everyone before me who said that it's really rich and uh, We'll uh, take time to digest uh, and uh, exploit all the evidence which has been collected. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, and I think uh, the way I or the way I saw I could contribute is really to take further some of the points mentioned. But uh, what I saw myself is that I was uh, addressing uh, similar questions which uh, have already been mentioned. Uh, I'm fully with Slavo on the point of, uh, of, of finding a window of opportunity. And, and for me, uh, the rich part uh, on teleworkability uh, and, and all the different constraints uh, are about a, a bigger picture, a bigger question, which is very difficult uh, to pin down. So uh, for me, it's, uh, it's just one element of the of the bigger transition uh, to improve the competitiveness of the labor force. Uh, and what I think, and, and this, this is where I see uh, uh, any future work or challenges or, um, that can be tackled uh, in, in future research is, is to understand exactly the, this learning process, uh, how long it takes, how much it costs, uh, because, uh, I mean, from my personal experience, I joined the uh, International Telecom Union uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And this is an organization which is uh, looking at uh, ICTs and digitalization as part of a UN uh, system as a, as a specialized agency. And yet it took considerable time and efforts at all levels to adjust. And uh, some processes uh, could be solved quickly, some uh, took uh, still months and, and years. Uh, and I think this should not be uh, underestimated and, and should be better measured uh, if there is any way to do that. And the other point is that uh, one of the key promises of digitalization is that distance is dead, but that's not the case apparently. Uh, and and uh, I think the report really shows a lot of interesting reasons why it's not, uh, that location still matters very much. And there are really uh, clear cross-country differences. But there's another dimension of the gaps which I want to highlight, and that's the within-country differences. Uh, let me highlight three additional examples before moving on to, to discuss AI. Uh, so one of the uh, three uh, within-country differences or gaps, uh, which should uh, not be underestimated, and uh, the coverage maps there is information on that, but the urban-rural divide is, sorry? 
sound was a bit lost, maybe your microphone moved, but now it sounded fine. Okay. So the first uh, difference or gap is the urban rural gap. Uh, this is uh, ITU data, so uh, uh, fresh data coming from our own uh, data collection from, uh, from countries, where it's evident that, especially in the CIS region, uh, rural population uh, use the internet, less than 70% of, of them reported they did so in 2020, whereas 85% in urban areas. Now, there, there's also an important cross-country divide. But there's another dimension which should not be underestimated, which is the skills gap. And I, I want to highlight another dimension, which, uh, which is probably there, but not pronounced enough, and I think it's crucial. And that is the, uh, the basic skills, which is uh, simply uh, using uh, copy-paste and uh, using email uh, for, for your work, where uh, the population of Uzbekistan, 14% uh, of the population reports having uh, the skill or having used this skill, applied it in the last uh, three months, whereas uh, the gap is big in, in other countries of the region, 63% in Slovakia. But uh, between basic skills and advanced skills, that is having the skill to develop software or, or run even the simplest programming for automating tasks, is uh, really uh, uh, hardly there. So uh, less than 5% of the population at most. Uh, and, and this is essential for uh, being competitive in, uh, in a digital setting, not just in a passive, but in an active way. And the third gap, uh, you know, here I have some names, but uh, the third gap I want to highlight is the affordability gap. And I'm focusing on fixed broadband, and here I'm pro probably uh, responding a bit to the previous comment uh, on the importance of uh, the infrastructure. But I want to highlight that fixed broadband is probably uh, at least before 5G can really spread. Fixed broadband is really the, the crucial infrastructure which uh, you need to perform uh, meaningful activities and uh, meaningful teleworking uh, from home. Uh, and, and here there is a within country gap uh, in, in many cases where, uh, yeah, fixed broadband is fairly affordable in the, in the Eastern Europe and uh, the CIS region. This comes again from uh, our price trends report uh, released last year. But what, one of the important things to highlight is that there is a fair a share of the population uh, who cannot afford, uh, and that is the bottom 40% who can hardly afford a uh, fixed broadband uh, connection. Uh, and that means an important trade off for them. So, uh, now, <coughs> and of course, this was not about affording equipment. So. Now, the other interesting question, and uh, here uh, the report is fantastic, and Joka was uh, highlighting how uh, companies fear the advancement of automation and AI. But what we've noticed, and here I would like to uh, bring you some examples from uh, our recent research, which uh, I started uh, a couple of years ago with the uh, former colleagues where we are trying to actually measure what AI means in terms of the real economy. Uh, and, and of course, most of the existing evidence is about industrial robots, which is a bit misleading because that's, uh, those are the big machines you, uh, that are used for manufacturing cars and, and, and in other sectors, but uh, AI is mostly about algorithms. Uh, it's very difficult to pin down what they are, uh, and very difficult to, uh, uh, to find out if a company is actually using it. I mean, most of us are passive users of AI if we are using productivity tools or simple uh, office tools, uh, and we're feeding uh, systems with our data, uh, but we don't have any influence on the algorithms. Uh, of course, it will likely have a positive impact on our productivity, but 
how about the active use of AI? And, and that's uh, the focus, uh, or that's been the focus of our research where we try to understand companies who have actively or as a strategic choice uh, used AI to perform either their core activities, the, their process innovation, uh, process innovators, or those who have built new products which are really about, uh, or which include AI, or where AI is itself the product. So, I am very sorry, you have two minutes left. Fantastic, yeah, just uh, to highlight uh, that uh, this is uh, recent work uh, where we have three key findings and just to highlight uh, what, because I think it's interesting for transition economies. One is that the takeoff of AI is really happening only in the last decade and is present in all industries. So a sectoral distinction doesn't really work when it comes to understanding uh, AI exposure. It's really a micro fine grain uh, level where, where we can really get understanding. That's the finding we have from uh, a micro data set, which we built from uh, company level data and, and patent data. Uh, and here you can really see that the EBRD region is, uh, is peripheral when it comes to uh, the, the big uh, developers of uh, AI in terms of patenting. The other questions we looked at was the impact of uh, AI on uh, corporate uh, productivity and employment. So first on productivity, it, it's again, very difficult to measure, but uh, now finally, I think uh, the time is ripe to, to get some evidence. And, and this is uh, a full sample of companies from Europe and Asia, but uh, uh, very, would be very keen to understand uh, beyond uh, and in other geographic areas. And what we see is that uh, AI development, uh, and of course this study has a lot of limitations, uh, as it uses patent data and, and tries to measure the direct effect on the inventor companies. But what's interesting is that it boosts productivity by about 3%. And that is quite similar to what we see when it comes to uh, the employment effect, uh, and, and that's probably the real question where we want to understand how uh, AI is uh, substituting uh, existing uh, labor, uh, it's uh, generating sufficient income to offset and, and uh, with, with increase productivity and, and generate a large enough demand without cannibalizing existing products so that where the product innovation could really boost employment. And what we found was that for uh, these 3,500 front runner AI inventor companies, the impact is really small. So yes, uh, if you invent uh, AI technology, you are most likely generating new employment but it is unlikely to compensate the labor saving effect in downstream sectors. And what's interesting is that it's concentrated in service sectors and, and younger firms. Happy to elaborate more, but uh, I would like to finish my comment with, with, with this one point that uh, all the, uh, the gaps and the uh, emergence or the fusion of AI technology uh, is, is about uh, a, a danger of creating parallel societies uh, and, and the, unless there is a targeted intervention to uh, address those left behind, uh, this can have uh, really uh, dangerous uh, implications uh, for, for the success of uh, catch up and transition and even socioeconomic stability. Uh, think of access to information and uh, latest technology and, and uh, the ability to keep upgrading your skill. So the, the, um, and the gap is opening. And of course, it's not only about investment in skills. So I'm uh, fully with uh, the previous speakers there. Uh, it's uh, investing in infrastructure and especially data infrastructure and governance uh, and privacy and cybersecurity. Uh, just thank you once again. And, uh, Thank you very much for uh, a very interesting and uh, quite applied presentation with specific references to practical issues and practical problems. 
um, Joka, any comments? Yes, thank you very much again for your time as well and for the very useful comments. I really liked um, the way you posed the question at the very beginning about it being a window of opportunity to improve the competitiveness of the labor force and also that in the context of the last slide of how to avoid creation of parallel societies also very much echoing earlier comments about how to make sure um, this spills over to other sectors. Um, I think there was also some discussion in house about how our next transition report should maybe look at some um, thing in the context of renegotiated or challenged social contracts, um, also uh, motivated by recent events. Um, so it's very interesting. Um, thank you very much for all the information and the references on AI as well. Um, I'll have a look and I will also pass it on to colleagues. Um, I like the examples you gave with your latest data on the urban versus rural and relative to cross country divides as well, because I think it in many areas holds more generally for many of our countries that while the capital cities may be increasingly looking like advanced Europe, the gap between the capital cities and the rest of the country, and I'm again sitting in rural Hungary saying this, um, may be widening. So thank you very much. Excellent. Okay, so I can suppose we can move on to the last speaker, but by far not the least, uh, Julia Korosteleva. Uh, thank you very much, Elias, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this panel discussion uh, today. Um, and um, actually, I really enjoyed reading the report, but more specifically, this last chapter on fintech and banks and transition. Um, uh, and uh, this actually largely echoes uh, also the work that we are currently doing with uh, some of uh, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, at Kazminsky University. So I would perhaps then be uh, drawing on some of uh, the also findings from our project in uh, uh, providing this discussion today. So um, similar to previous speakers, I think I'll focus first uh, uh, quickly on um, summarizing perhaps the key trends in digitalization of the financial sector, drawing on the report, but also, as I said, extending to other studies and uh, on the implications as well of uh, uh, fintech for the economy and society in general, focusing on both like uh, pros and costs of this. And finally, I think I'll uh, largely then highlight the issues which perhaps I thought uh, uh, have been missing in this chapter, but they could constitute also some uh, future interesting research agenda. So, uh, as I said, I'll uh, uh, largely base this discussion on the report, but also beyond this, uh, I'll uh, refer to other studies, more recent studies in the area, and uh, also to our uh, research project on the effect of new technology of banking sector in the EU and SMEs lending, uh, which uh, we currently are engaged in partnership with uh, Kosminski University in Poland. Uh, currently, uh, this work is still in progress, but we are already close to completing our first uh, working paper on this, uh, uh, with a focus on lending, uh, but focusing here not on fintech uh, per se, as uh, promoted by uh, these financial technology firms and big technology firms, but uh, to what extent and the banks themselves actually embrace this uh, uh, financial innovations and to what extent and this helps them to stimulate this lending. Uh, focusing on different channels of this. Right, um, um, so recent digitalization trends and in financial uh, services uh, uh, has been primarily sparked by then this financial technology firms and big technology firms. Uh, with them actually tending to occupy niches uh, uh, to serve customers, which uh, have been largely actually underserved previously by um, traditional banks. Um, this include also uh, customers located, say, in rural areas or uh, being distant, say, from uh, 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 headquarters of the banks, or where there is like lack of, uh, say, uh, branch uh, network coverage uh, from traditional banks. Um, uh, interestingly, that uh, facilitating then uh, sectoral inno uh, innovation actually across different sectors, like uh, in credit markets and 
payments and also welfare management. The challenge then uh, the power of uh, traditional banks, uh, encouraging them also to uh, engage in financial innovation. Uh, but according to EBID, if you look at this graph, actually uh, banks uh, see actually fintechs uh, to pose threats more in uh, payment services area uh, and less so safe, for example, still in corporate lending, trade finance or lending to SMEs, which still seem to be largely controlled by uh, traditional banks or banks which are then keen now on promoting uh, also digitalization. Uh, what I like in the report is that also draw on the differences between Central and Eastern Europe and Western Europe, specifically highlighting some uh, of the barriers, uh, which perhaps then uh, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, contribute to uh, digitalization process to have its effect in Central and Eastern Europe lagging behind. Um, um, it's maybe to answer also Ely's question at the beginning, so the report highlights exactly like um, still low um, levels of financial literacy, uh, then poor digital infrastructure, but also a weak uh, technological uh, ecosystem in the region uh, as uh, potential barriers for them to accelerate uh, the digitalization trends of, uh, in financial services. But the, there are some remarkable actually exceptions, and uh, once again to go back to the earliest point, uh, here you can see the Baltic states uh, uh, standing um, um, actually uh, quite uh, firmly and being front leaders in alternative finance markets uh, developments, uh, um, um, where they would have this development actually much larger compared that would be expected given the uh, current level of economic development. Uh, they actually tend to specialize more in um, um, uh, uh, peer to peer uh, consumer lending. Uh, uh, but uh, as Joker mentioned at the beginning, so uh, one of the constraints for them is uh, that they have small markets. Uh, and what's interesting to note here is the strategies that uh, these fintechs adopt uh, in uh, overcoming these barriers. So they are more aggressive in terms of their internationalization strategies uh, to become uh, uh, global fast uh, so from the inception and uh, uh, to spread also to cover, to provide the services to um, uh, customers actually in the whole European continent. Um, uh, drawing on the pros and cons, so there is a actually fast growing uh, literature which emphasizes uh, uh, um, uniformly that uh, actually uh, financial technology helps easing up credit constraints and first of all in the form of like uh, making credit more accessible, so increasing the availability of credit and specifically uh, for previously or historically disadvantaged groups, uh, which uh, are not related to location, but also in terms of gender, in terms of age, uh, and also SMEs as well, uh, which uh, by their nature are information uh, opaque, so there is lack of the credit history, which uh, always been not in their favor in terms of uh, uh, securing a credit from traditional banks. So overall, this helps in facilitating financial inclusion. And uh, the ways uh, why we then, then FinTech effect this is through um, um, better data availability, more accurate data, actually data sharing itself, uh, uh, and uh, which actually makes uh, the credit assessment of applications easier, faster, and so is uh, with the help of uh, various AR algorithms. So basically, uh, it uh, improves the whole process of uh, uh, credit scoring. Uh, now, what was missing in the report, I think to a large extent it was mentioned, but I don't think there is any explicit evidence on uh, the effect of uh, financial technology on cost uh, reduction, of, of uh, cost reduction of debt. But in our actually project, we explicitly look into this. And what's interesting, we find that uh, we observe actually that financial technology adopted by banks helps to reduce the cost of uh, debt for uh, firms, but only actually benefiting there is some um, um, kind of um, um, modest evidence to uh, support that it uh, reduces this uh, cost of debt for startups, but not for SMEs overall. Actually, what we observe for a population of SMEs, uh, for example, of SMEs that we have uh, using Amadeus data, is that uh, there is actually uh, an increased cost of intimidation for them rather than decreased cost, uh, which is uh, not in line with uh, expectation uh, and theoretical findings. 
Um, now, uh, we also find actually that uh, there is a, a reduced need for collateral. So collateral is becoming less of an issue than uh, when applying for a loan for SME specifically. Uh, in terms of actually the downside of FinTech, as, uh, as long as they help uh, easing up uh, credit constraints, there is also some evidence for that they exacerbate these credit constraints and increase certain risks. Uh, and uh, more specifically, uh, there is uh, quite an emerging literature looking at now at the bias of uh, credit scoring algorithms, once again, disadvantaging specific groups uh, of customers like of ethnic minority or gender. Uh, there is also, um, um, for example, our study shows that there is increased cost of uh, intermediation for uh, small and medium sized businesses. Uh, there is also increase in risky lending, uh, increase uh, over indebtedness of specific customer growth, which all have implications and for future financial stability. And um, uh, among the downside of fintech would be also the uh, concerns regarding consumer privacy, uh, privacy and also regulatory uncertainty, uh, which are still kind of uh, uh, overlooked. Um, so uh, just to highlight- I am and, very sorry, you have two minutes left. Yes, it's exactly uh, how it plans and the presentation. <laughs> now, um, uh, the future research agendas and uh, perhaps would be, um, should be moving in the direction on focusing more uh, in terms of looking at different types of fintech solution to what extent they are beneficial, say, in uh, resolving various issues, including like lending, for example, to a specific group of customers, uh, not only in terms of the development of infrastructure, uh, uh, which is fairly uh, emphasized in the report, but also like looking at digital analytical solutions, uh, automated solutions, and so forth and so forth. Um, then um, uh, we shouldn't be overlooking also the issue of algorithm biasness and more work should be done on this. Uh, that would also help regulators uh, to see whether there is needs and to request, say, lenders to um, 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 disclose basically the uh, algorithm behind credit scoring. Uh, interesting would be also to look at uh, whether financial technology then leads to greater digital divide and inequality, uh, which has been partly already, re uh, re um, uh, we, we felt this through the actually pandemic that no, uh, not all customer groups benefit equally uh, from digitalization of financial services. And those uh, who are less educated, uh, blue car collar uh, workers, they would be, uh, they would continue to be disadvantaged in this case that could lead to greater actually inequality. The issues of uh, over indebtedness could be also interesting to see and potential threats uh, in terms of uh, financial stability. Along with this, like uh, was focusing on different types of innovation, like uh, uh, whether um, outsourcing to fintechs or innovating in-house would be interesting to see to what extent exposures and to single product providers uh, uh, would also uh, be associated with higher systemic risk. Um, and issues of complementarity and substitution between fintechs and banks also quite an interesting future agenda to consider. Uh, currently, we observe that uh, fintechs play more sort of complementary role to bank lending, but uh, what's going to be uh, happening in future as, uh, as this landscape is going to change in favor of fintechs, which uh, actually exhibit more and more uh, uh, playing high role in aggregating various services within one single, say, our provision. So just to conclude, uh, we can see, obviously, through the report, uh, focusing on other studies that recent technological developments in finance actually help uh, uh, have brought some new opportunities for customers addressing various uh, uh, problems for them and offering various uh, alternative solutions, and specifically in the area of lending. Um, uh, they also challenge the power of incumbent banks, uh, stimulating them to innovate. And what we observe now happening in the banking sector, it's more a shift from relationship-based uh, banking towards transaction-based banking. And uh, finally, I think uh, I should mention that basically we should be aware that digitalization of uh, financial services does uh, not come uh, just generating opportunities, but also risks uh, which uh, have to be uh, watched carefully by policymakers uh, uh, to ensure then uh, to strike the balance basically between uh, achieving the goal of increasing financial inclusion uh, uh, while also preserving financial stability. Thank you. Thank you very much for the thorough presentation. And for the last time, uh, I will go to Jopa Kosark. 
Thank you very much um, for the very nice uh, comments and suggestions and also the new references, which I'll definitely pass on to my colleagues who are working on the chapter and continue working on these projects, including on reuse costs and your other ideas for further research um, on over indebtedness, actually, um, as we're approaching the end, um, I think one of my favorite examples from the TR is a sentence hidden somewhere in the last chapter. That, uh, it's a reference uh, to research that shows that loans taken out late at night are less likely to be repaid. Um, and on algorithm bias, definitely something to look into um, also as our HR is gently nudging us towards becoming more digital even being a sort of public enterprise um, and we're reluctant um, so far um, and wary of the biases it reinforces. Um, so thank you very much um, for the very nice suggestions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the very interesting discussion. Uh, that brings us to the end, all of us. And uh, just as a farewell, I would just like to do a round robin. Uh, among all panelists and have them suggest uh, a topic they would be interested in for next year's uh, EBRD report, if they like. So in presentation order, uh, if I go to Slavo Radosevic. You mean topic for the next year? Uh, well, <laughs> yes. first, uh, first two comments, uh, well, two comments. First, I think based on today's presentation, we could see that uh, uh, this has become such a huge area that you cannot uh, anymore address it as it is done this year means together from you know gender inequalities to uh, technology artificial intelligence there it, it simply has the area has grown too big so it has to go specifically the issue which uh, let's say in the context of, of eastern europe which uh, for me is completely uncovered uh, to give you one just uh, data in ukraine uh, 44 percent of uh, employees work in a so-called personal entrepreneur system mode, which means that they are not really full employees, but they are like um, individual entrepreneurs. So you come to IT company, big company, which has several thousand people, and they are actually, none of them is on the books. They are all personal entrepreneurs paying a few percentages of, uh, for, for uh, some health insurance. And it's a kind of extreme flexibility of labor market is the biggest uberization of, of uh, labor force anywhere that I have seen. And I think that in other countries you will find it. I think this is one extremely interesting social and economic issue, which is the kind of within labor markets with the huge implications, which I think I would like to see at least as part of the future reports. Thank you very much for uh, the contribution. Uh, Randolph Bruno. Yes, um, I, I think, uh, uh, I mentioned this in my uh, last slide uh, about uh, greening. Uh, I, even if uh, I, I have to say, I'm also very much uh, uh, into the uh, idea of developing more about inequalities. So, uh, but um, kind of taking, taking stock of my presentation and uh, what we have done uh, uh, with LAVO and what the European uh, um, Union is, is doing now. Why European Union? Because the region is not only that, because it's, it's an area that is seen sort of a benchmark. So the relationship between greening and digitalization, so it's, it's quite important, also because they are on the agenda. So they, they are really the, the, the big money, European Union now is there. And, and so uh, I, I heard from uh, Zoka that there are probably a couple of chapters uh, uh, planned on that in next year. So. She already answered my, my, my question with it. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, Daniel Fertesi. Yeah, uh, I, I think the inequalities uh, which I mentioned uh, can really be explored further. So there, there's a lot of within country gaps um, and, and many dimensions and that's, that's something that could be cross-cutting. But I'm, I'm fully uh, also interested in reading something on greening, but, but I would position it in an energy transition uh, aspect. So how do you deal with the uh, geopolitical and uh, power? So the political dimensions, which have push and pull factors from uh, 
from all areas. Uh, think of the financial investment uh, the European Commission is putting into uh, the greening, how that compensates or, or how to uh, use that. Uh, something on, yeah, on finding uh, sustainable solutions is, is really interesting to read. Thanks. Thank you very much. And Julia Korosteleva? Thank you, Elis. Um, I think I will go back, uh, go back to the point of overborrowing, actually. I thought that the, um, what we observe now, first of all, uh, there is a definitely like a moral hazard behavior stimulated by fintech on the side of borrowers. So there is an increase in um, uh, then this risky lending happening and uh, among different customers and uh, to what uh, proportion it's what we are not aware. So it would be interesting to look at to what extent an overborrowing is a widespread problem, to what extent it poses a risk for financial stability and to what extent it may be um, like fintech in general, fintech tech boom could actually be um, leading to another burst of the economy, a potential new financial crisis. So that's the issues I would be looking at. Thank you very much. And uh, my money would also be on uh, inequality, but with particular reference on income and wage inequality because of the dividing labor. Uh, people who are able to basically put their work around their life, uh, contrary to people who are not able to do that. And uh, I believe that given the digitalization that has become uh, very pronounced in the last couple of years and uh, the evolution in the labor market, that divide will become both more prominent and uh, more pronounced in economies that are already unequal enough. So with that note, thank you all very much for being here and for the time you dedicated uh, to the presentation. Uh, I honestly hope that next year we will be able to have that in person so we will actually see each other. Uh, please forward me your slides if you'd like to, so I can share them with uh, all the participants. And SIS uh, will always be a place where you are, you are welcome, and we'll be very happy to have you here uh, at another occasion. A very big thank you from my side as well to everyone for the very thoughtful comments as always. Um, I will definitely pass them on and would like to share your slides with colleagues as well, if that's okay. Um, thank you very much and very nice seeing you all hopefully in person next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Zaka. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great discussion. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.